I'm the chief scientist at Gradient, and uh, today I'll be talking about how we trained uh, large language models to be finance experts. Um, now, yeah, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Uh, so, so before kind of I, I start getting into the, the details here, I wanted to make a couple of observations. And the, the first one is that uh, foundational models have been growing at an exponential rate, uh, right? So not only do you kind of bespoke AI companies each have their own foundational models, but data companies, uh, general tech companies, uh, they all have their own flavor of the language model, each with its own features uh, and use cases. And uh, another observation, which is, which is pretty related, is that the context length, right, the, the number of tokens that, that you can fit into a prompt uh, has increased quite a bit over the past year. Um, the, the largest context length models about a year ago were something like 100K. Um, and uh, in the past year, they've grown to about 40 times that, uh, just in models released in the past few months, including one released by Gradient. Um, and, and both of these uh, observations are evidence to kind of one, one point, and that's the large language models are not one size fits all. Um, especially when you get to kind of more complicated use cases, uh, taking a, a generalist language model uh, or, or a base language model kind of off the shelf is, isn't really going to get you too far. Um, and, and I realize I'm, I'm talking at the open models track of a conference. I probably don't need to convince you guys uh, too much of this statement. But um, it is pretty important for us at Gradient. There's actually our, our foundational thesis for, for what we built, uh, which is an AI foundry. And uh, for us, what an AI foundry is, is it's a collection of custom language models uh, as well as a number of workflow primitives. And what we do is we take all these pieces and components together uh, to create solutions that are a custom fit uh, for our customers. And, and today I'm gonna talk about specifically uh, our solutions for the finance domain, right? Building financial experts. Um, and, and for those solutions, really uh, two components have been incredibly useful. Uh, one uh, should be Fairly, fairly straightforward is our uh, domain-specific finance language model, and the other one is a context length uh, extension that we've worked on. Um, and, and so why are these important specifically for finance? Well, uh, a little while ago, we, we got together and wrote down kind of six requirements for finance applications of language models that, that generalist models uh, tend, tend to lack or fall a bit short on. Um, you know, if you look at these uh, requirements, they're, they're fairly general. They kind of apply across uh, industries, but in particular for finance, they seem pretty important. Um, and today I'm just going to talk about two of them uh, that happen to be paired uh, with uh, the two solutions uh, that I also want to talk about, the finance language model and, and the extended context length. So um, jumping, uh, jumping right into it. Uh, the first one is the uh, finance language model. Um, you know, you might be wondering uh, why, why even have a domain-specific language model? Uh, why is domain knowledge important? Uh, the, the reason is, is that your, your general purpose language models, like, like the GPTs of the world, um, they are uh, trained on a, on a very broad set of data, uh, kind of broad, not deep, uh, especially in, in kind of like more technical situations, like technical financial information. Um, and as kind of like an illustrative example on why this is important, uh, here's a chart from a recent research paper, and it shows that even for very large models, right, the, the red line at the top there is for a 176 billion parameter model, um, you need something on the order of thousands of relevant documents in the model's pre-training uh, in order for the model to get decent, I mean, here it's even above 50% accuracy uh, on answering a related question, right? And so uh, kind of what this implies is that if you ask uh, a language model questions uh, about uh, data that's kind of like in the tails of its training data, um, then it, it's going to do a poor job at answering those questions, right? And so, um, you know, the, the natural way to fix this is to, is to say, okay, uh, base model doesn't know a lot about finance. Let's train it some finance. Um, 
an issue there. Um, and, and here I'm going to talk about kind of how we trained our, our finance specific language model is, uh, so an issue there is that there's, there's a whole lot of financial data out there, right? Like way more uh, than you could possibly uh, review or look at manually. Um, and so that requires creating an automated data pipeline. Um, and we, that's what we did. We created one, uh, probably the, the most uh, compelling or interesting part of this data pipeline is the automated data curation, uh, where we borrowed ideas from uh, the membership inference literature. And so what we do is we amass a, a whole large corpus of, of training data. Um, and then uh, we use techniques to, to try to see if a particular document, uh, if there's a high chance that it was already in the model's training data, right? So maybe you have like a llama base model, you have a document, uh, and you can run some of these techniques to, to get a probability of whether or not the model has already seen that data in training. Uh, so you filter out all the data that the model hasn't seen before. Uh, what you're left with is a much smaller set of data. Now that's uh, manageable to, to look at through human review. Uh, and then finally pass through to uh, synthetic data augmentation, right? Both to upsample data uh, and to handle uh, some variations in, in data representation and formatting. Um, and, and kind of like the, the last part of, of the recipe for, for how to train um, domain-specific uh, language models uh, is to take that data set that you created and, and to pass it through a training pipeline. Um, I think by now a training pipeline like this is, is fairly standard. Uh, there, there's two main parts. One is the continuous pre-training. So you take that data set uh, that you created on, on the previous slide uh, and you do kind of next token prediction uh, on it uh, off of a, of a base existing model, right? So again, uh, we're taking a, a base foundational model like a llama model uh, to start with. And then the second part uh, is you do, um, is you run alignment on the model. Uh, here, if we ran both supervised fine tuning and preference optimization. Um, and, and kind of the way I like to think about uh, the division between uh, these two tasks is pre-training it is something like if you had a bunch of textbooks and you wanted uh, a model to read all those textbooks and, and understand all, all that information or retain all that information. And alignment is kind of like uh, then instructing the model on how to use that information or, or best practices and what to do with that. Um, and so if pre-training is like reading textbooks, alignment is like maybe like taking an exam uh, on a class or working on a project. Right, and um, that's really all I wanted to say about the domain-specific language model. Um, now I want to talk about the, see how much time I have, great, um, about the other part, which is the uh, extended context and uh, how extended context or long context language models uh, help us address hallucinations. Right, uh, to give a quick refresher, what are hallucinations? Well, it's a pretty broad term uh, and it's used quite frequently nowadays. It's, it's whenever uh, you run inference on a model when you give it a query and it generates content that is irrelevant or made up or inconsistent with the input data. Um, there's been a fair amount of research as to the cause of hallucinations. A lot of that research points to deficiencies in the underlying training data, right? So some, some causes might be just the training data is outdated, right? You're asking the model a question on information that is now updated since the training data. Uh, another one is uh, a lot of the training data uh, practices require automated data collection. And if there's ever inconsistencies or bugs in that uh, data collection, um, you can get source reference divergence, right? So the model is just trained on data that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, and, and there's a few other reasons. All of these uh, can uh, encode information in the model's memory banks that there isn't quite accurate, uh, and, and that'll cause the model to hallucinate. And while uh, alignment or, or uh, continued training of the model can alleviate hallucinations, um, at Gradient we find that actually in context learning, so uh, working directly on the prompt during the execution pipeline uh, is the most direct and, and sample efficient way to reduce hallucinations, right? Because uh, what you can do is you can put in a, a relatively small amount of information directly into the prompt, uh, kind of at inference time, uh, and sort of uh, plaster over or band-aid over uh, issues uh, with, with the model's training data. Um, and so that's great. In-context learning works really well. Um, the issue is it works so well that when you start doing it, you want to do more and more of it. 
and, and then kind of you run into the, one, of, one of the biggest pain points uh, with this practice, or one of the biggest bottlenecks, uh, which is the context length. Um, and I'm guessing that this is an issue that, that many of you in this room have, have come across yourselves. Um, and that's, uh, you, you just run out of prompt uh, in, in terms of, for in-context learning. Um, a few examples uh, for why that can be an issue. Uh, if you're trying to put in a few shot examples into the prompt, you run out of prompt space before you run out of examples, and I have to spend a lot of time in, in choosing the particular example or, or working on some kind of like lossy summarization technique. Um, for more complex pro problems, they may require some brittle uh, pre-processing pipelines, each can have errors. Um, and also, if you do some kind of external memory management, such as RAG, uh, those systems tend to have poor performance when the chunks that get pulled uh, require them to be interrelated, right? So if you pull one chunk and another chunk that you need to pull uh, has to reference a previous chunk to, to know if it needs to get uh, queried, right? And RAG does, uh, typically does a pretty poor job at that. Um, right, so context length uh, is the bottleneck for this, so the most natural thing to do is just extend the context length. Um, and, and so that's, that's what we did with, with some of our models. Uh, and here, really, I just wanted to talk about a couple of examples of what suddenly becomes possible uh, when you have a context length that, that's sort of in the realm of, of a million tokens long. Um, here on, on the left-hand side, uh, is an example showing that you can now actually put thousands of examples directly into the prompt. Uh, and that kind of gets you back into this kind of like domain learning regime that I talked about earlier. Uh, it's just now it is uh, on the fly and at inference time, right? So it can be very adaptive to the problem. Um, and uh, you, you do find that uh, for a lot of tasks out there, this like thousands of examples mark is actually necessary. Uh, to get kind of production grade accuracy or, or dangerous levels of accuracy for a model. Um, and, and the other example is uh, with the long context length, uh, you can leverage what transformer models are, are natively really good at, which is being able to attend to every single token in the prompt. Um, and by doing that, you can actually have the model perform uh, fairly complicated reasoning uh, implicitly, just, just in through, through going through its uh, layers and attention layers. Um, and an example that, um, that we kind of uh, cooked up uh, in-house uh, was we took uh, books that were written by Mark Twain, the author, uh, and first we scrubbed the books of any kind of identifying information, right? So, so no mention of the author or anything like that. Uh, and then we gave that into the model, uh, into its prompt, into its context, and asked the model to generate uh, new stories in the same style. Uh, and after kind of five books of, of reference prompts, the model was uh, able to generate stories um, that convinced a, a separate critic model uh, that those short stories could have been actually written uh, by that same author, right? Uh, and, and in pretty actually like deep and intricate ways, not just kind of like stylistic similarity or language, uh, but down to theme and characters and setting and, and things like that. So uh, kind of the punchline is, is that long context language models give you more uh, grounded and robust systems, and there's fewer moving parts, much more is contained in the language model, which, which is the thing that we all care about, um, and, and that in turn reduces hallucinations. Right, so, um, you know, th those are basically the, the two components, um, two solutions of our platform that I wanted to, to describe to you all today. Um, one of the things that, that we believe in pretty strongly at, at Gradient is to have transparent and verifiable benchmarks. Uh, and also we're pretty passionate in giving back to the open source community because a lot of what we've uh, built our work on are, are open source uh, models and techniques themselves. Uh, and so for both of those solutions, we've open source models uh, on our um, company page at Hugging Face. Um, one of them is the, the V Alpha Tross model. So that's the result of applying our uh, finance domain training on a Llama 2 base model. Um, and here the, the benchmarks show that after doing that, uh, it ends up being competitive uh, and actually better uh, competitive at kind of open LLM general uh, benchmarks and better at finance specific benchmarks uh, to models in, in the same class to its peers. And the other model is um, a 1 million context length extension of uh, a Llama 3 base model that we released pretty recently, 
Um, and with it, uh, we were able to get 100% uh, needle in a haystack scores actually uh, above 1 million context links. That's the first image. Uh, and also had a pretty substantial performance improvement uh, over the base model on a ruler long context length benchmark. That's a benchmark put out by NVIDIA. Um, and that brings this model kind of in the realm of uh, flagship long context models uh, like Gemini 1.5 Pro, GPT-4, and, and Command R+. Right, and so the, these models are open source, publicly available, I invite you all to, to go and check them out. Um, and about a, about a minute left, so uh, I'll finish off uh, here. Uh, there's, of course, lots more to building uh, an AI financial expert. These are just two pieces of the puzzle, even though they're two important ones. Uh, and if you guys are interested in finding out more, uh, feel free to check us out on our, on our website or reach out and contact us. Cool. Thank you.